Um, what I wanted to talk about today is we're, we're now talking about these uh, linkings between different uh, physics, you know, ComSol multi-physics, <coughs> as they rename themselves. So I wanted to do these um, four things. I wanted to talk briefly about um, how we might implement things uh, yeah. uh, in EGFEM, just quickly, um, because I tried doing it. I also loaded this new version of EGFEM up onto Angel uh, because there's some parts of it that don't yet work. And so, as you'll see, you might uh, enjoy trying to figure out exactly uh, what those parts are as, as, uh, as a challenge. But if you haven't opened the, f the um, console file, essentially, the chances of you doing that are probably not, not very uh, large, which is okay, so I'm not worried. Uh, we'll talk about other hydromechanical coupling for dual process systems, because we've talked about those. Um, how we might uh, couple other physics together, uh, such as thermal effects. And then uh, hopefully talk about explicitly coupled codes. So actually we've got a lot um, on our plate, so um, we'll have to meter a little bit how we, we do this, this stuff. Um, so the first stuff, I guess, was talking about um, how to couple physics together. We went through the derivation for uh, from first principles for finite element implementation of this uh, uh, single porosity pore elasticity. Um, I guess I could go back to the original components, but you'll remember that we ended up with uh, basically a couple of equations, and the equations looked something like, if I just take this, that, um, just borrowing from this down here, uh, this times displacement rates, plus uh, this times... Um, rates of changes of fluid pressures are equal to rates of changes of forces and also something that included um, pressures. Uh, I'm not, I won't be very rigorous about these pluses or minuses. Um, beta 2 1 times displacement rates uh, plus something acted on by fluid pressure changes in time is equal to flow rates. Um, all of these are written at some time that we choose, tau, uh, and then we can modify them appropriately. And so what are they? This is a stiffness matrix. where this is uh, Hooke's law, and this is the strain displacement relationships. You might remember that we actually used uppercase A to, dis, uh, to differentiate the fact that strains are related to displacements through the derivatives of the shape functions used for the solid mechanics part. Um, what is this? This is a storage vector. So this is formally our stiffness matrix. Like. Uh, I'm going to run out of space, of course. What is this? This is a, a, a um, uh, it's not a, it's not a storage matrix, is it? It's something like uh, a transposed M D D V. Uh, the derivatives of the shape functions. This M vector was just. In two dimensions, it was equal to 1, 1, 0. And if you recall, it was what allowed us to take um, total stresses being equal to effective stresses plus fluid pressures. A scalar vector is vectors, right? So, this is, so it only acts on the normal magnitudes of the stresses, not the shear stresses. And so this was this uh, matrix here. And so if in a physical sense, this is our stiffness matrix. This is a body force, which is due to the pressure uh, differentials in space, which are also changing with time. Uh, this was our conductance matrix. So this is, I think we called A transpose D A D V. And this is uh, Darcy's law. 
Um, and the other two um, components, this, these two are the um, transpose of each other, interestingly enough, which I always find 2, 1 is equal to B, 1, 2 transpose, so I won't write that out. And this is just a storage matrix. It's what we've called before the S matrix, which is just uh, the, the product of the shape functions integrated over the volume. Basically taking the volume of the element and saying that if the fluid pressures change in that element, then the volume of fluid, because the lower equation is a conservation of mass equation, the volume of fluid, the volume the fluid shrinks by is equal to um, uh, the volume, and I guess it's pre-multiplied by um, the porosity. I'm going to run out of space. Let me put it afterwards. Multiplied by the porosity divided by the stiffness of the fluid. So in other words, pressure changes, then the volume of the fluid in that porous medium changes. And so those are the individual components, and so that translates kind of into the expression that we have uh, down here. And uh, if you want to implement it, I don't really want to spend a huge amount of time doing this other than just kind of talking gen general terms about it. So these individual matrices you can evaluate and put as in the arrangement down below. It's good to get a feel for physically what uh, they represent. If you then, for instance, substitute each of these two relationships into this vector, then you can take all the terms that you don't know onto the left-hand side, which would be these, and the terms that you do know onto the right-hand side. And if you write it out in longhand, it's, it's this lowest, lowermost equation. And so uh, what you can do is you can solve that equation just as um, if we write it out in longhand, it's basically a x equals b, nothing more than that. So you have this matrix, which are all of these terms here. You have the load vector, which you don't know, which you'd like to be able to solve for. And you have all the terms that you put here. You know these as forces are prescribed, or rates of changes of forces are prescribed as boundary conditions. So you know what those are. You put a load on it. Interestingly enough, it's a rate of change of load. So, so the first time step, the load will be equal to the magnitude of the load divided by the time step. And then after that, the magnitude of that load will be zero. And so if you think about putting a load on top of something like this, you apply it at time zero, then the load versus time curve will look like uh, this. Go away. Uh, first time step, it goes up to this magnitude. This is delta t. And then after that, it's constant. So you apply it, and then it's constant. And so if you look at the derivative of this, then this derivative is, is finite in the first time step. Then the derivative df dt equals zero afterwards, right? for, for obvious reasons. And so that's a little bit of a different boundary condition we're useful, used to adding. And these components here are exactly the same components of this. So this is the conductance matrix, which goes in here, which has just been combined because it existed here before. And we've combined it and multiplied by delta t because of delta t out here. But otherwise, everything gets put together. And so, as in all of this cases that we've dealt with for finite element models, uh, everything's localized. You take an expression, you define the element, and then you put together the matrices that uh, correspond to that. And so, if, for instance, we wanted to implement it in a triangular element, then our understanding of this element, if this is node 1, 2, and 3, then it would be how many degrees of freedom per node? Displacement in the x direction, displacement in the y direction, <coughs> and pressure. Displacement in the x direction at node 2, displacement in the y direction at node 2, 
pressure to, and likewise this. This would be for three, for three, for three, and three. And so you know from this that since this matrix is basically the stiffness matrix, it's going to be uh, six by six. If you define it in terms of rows and columns, six rows and six columns. Uh, this matrix here is going to be uh, six by three, just because it makes up. This is going to be the transpose of that, which will be three by six. And the conductance matrix, you know, is going to be three by three. And so altogether, these larger matrices, since it's going to be the same over here, this is going to be 9 by 9 uh, on each side. And so you start being able to put them together. And so the ability to do that is actually no different so from what we did with Navier-Stokes. We knew that in Navier-Stokes we had velocities x and y at the nodes. We had a fluid pressure at the nodes. And so we could put together the, the stiffness matrix in an appropriate way based on that. So without really um, uh, going through this in huge detail, um, I added an extra element subroutine to uh, this just for the hell of it, because I felt like doing it. I guess that's the data, but this is 2.5. And just very quickly to, to talk about it, you'll understand exactly what these things are. So everything gets localized. Uh, we come in with the stiffness matrix, the capacitance matrix, and the mass matrices to use as we want. We form them, we send them back to the main code. Um, we zero out these matrices. They start off, they're 9 by 9, uh, all of them, because of the uh, components. Um, we don't really have a mass matrix in this case. We have a matrix which is operated on by uh, rates of changes. So this could be the capacitance matrix. So if you like, this is our CL matrix, this is our KL matrix, and the mass matrix, I guess L stands for local, I think, in, in my terminology, if I think back to when this was done. And so they're all going to be um, 9 by 9. Uh, what are these properties? Uh, stiffness matrix, 2D, Hooke's Law. The uh, strain displacement matrix, the constitutive matrix for fluid flow, Darcy's law, two by two, and the uh, the A matrix, the derivatives of the shape functions for the for the uh, uh, triangular matrix where it's a scalar. So this is for triangular matrix. So the individual components arrive there, the modulus, Poisson ratio, permeability, porosity, and the stiffness, k sub f, will end up going there. The permeability, I think, is not the permeability, but the ratio of permeability to viscosity. And then the other things will start looking, uh, hopefully will make sense. We make the D matrix, which is 3 by 3, for the plane strain case. We make the conduct uh, Darcy's law matrix. So this is Hooke's law. This is Darcy's law, um, just with uh, terms on the leading diagonal. This M matrix. Um, which is 1, 1, 0, not uh, in a, a row. And this is this other matrix which we end up needing to calculate, which we never did for a uh, triangular element, remember, this one here. And so we know what the A matrix looks like for triangular element, for solid mechanics. We know what the M matrix looks like. But uh, since these are both constants, we can rewrite this as A transposed times m times the integral of the shape functions dv. And by definition, you know, the integrals of these shape functions, if you just rationalize exactly what it is, the shape function would be 1 at the point in question, 0 elsewhere. And so the volume of, the, the integrated volume of this is just going to be a third, a third, And so that's exactly what that relationship is here, somewhere here. Right? So this is this. This is this. Um, so, so those are the material properties. So then the other things just get taken out of the 
the solid mechanics uh, matrix and the, the flow matrix. And so uh, these are just uh, coordinates of the nodes. The strain displacement matrix is 3 by 2, which is this. 1 over the 2 times the area of the triangle and the individual components. The derivatives of the shape functions for the scalar value is this lowercase a matrix, which we've used also. Um, and then we can put together this stiffness matrix, which is really just this. So this is just it on its own. So zeros at the off diagonals and, uh, and the, real, the meat of the matter on the bottom right-hand side. So this is A transposed DA for the fluid part multiplied by air in thickness, and so it goes there. Um, and then uh, remember that instead of having the system of equations in terms of uh, the displacements at node 1, the displacements at node 2, displacements at node 3, and then the pressures, uh, we actually need it in the form where we have individually the displacements. Oh, I did this wrong, right? This is 1. Displacements at node 1, displacement at node 2, pressure at node 1. Displacements at node 2, displacement in y at node 2, and pressure at node 2. So we need to just reorder them for that. And so that's all that next part is. So they're in the right order. And then so with the uh, conductance matrix put together to give us this. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so with the conductance matrix put together, were they just reordered in some way? And then the capacitance matrix, the one that operates, if you like, on the derivatives of these terms, this matrix here, is just put together from these. So I, I threw away this. I ignored it. This is just the compressibility of water. Didn't worry about it. Um, this is the stiffness matrix, 6 by 6. And this is the matrix that says what the magnitude of the body forces are, because this top equation is just... Um, conservation momentum term. This is the transpose of that, and which is really just the magnitude of fluid that gets squeezed out as you strain the element. And we know exactly what those mag uh, matrices are. And so this is the stiffness matrix, A transpose DA, where these are the derivatives of the strain displacement, of the shape functions in the strain displacement. This is um, A transposed M times the integral of the shape functions uh, multiplied by area and thickness. So this this is this B int is just a third, a third, a third. This is you could have written this as the transpose of it, but it's just written out in the opposite way. And then if we throw away the compressibility of the fluid, this term here, if we throw this term away, we we're left without that. So in other words, all we're doing is I'm throwing out this particular term here. And, um, and then we just use that exactly in the same way that we did here. So now we have a, a, a stiffness matrix. We rearrange the columns and rows again. But the bottom line is we have a matrix that represents the capacitance, uh, the so-called B1213 matrix, one that represents the conductance, which is this C matrix in the other terminology. And then... Um, what it does when we go back here um, is it just gets put in the right place. And uh, the, the meat of this calculation, the only thing I changed was that um, it puts together the global matrices in the right places uh, and then uh, tries to solve it in terms of writing this backwards. And so the way that um, MATLAB easily does this, is it takes this matrix, which is, let's call it B U equals F dot B U, right? So this is B star, I guess, this one here. So in other words, this, this term here. And all it does is it writes itself as 
u is equal to v minus 1. I mean, this is symbolically how it does it. It's probably not the, the best way to solve this. And so once you know what this load vector is, once you know what this uh, left-hand side is, then the solution for that is just what's written exactly here. So you'll see this here. This is um, <coughs> this term here is this right-hand side. So this is the, the B matrix plus 1 over delta T times the C matrix. So this is the inverse matrix, and this is the, the right-hand side, which we're multiplying it by. And the only thing that's a little bit different is that in the first time step, you have to take the load vector and divide by delta t. So it gives this kind of impulse to the system. So, anyway, so that's kind of how it goes. So let's see if it works. Um, and here's the challenge to you. Um, the answer would be kind of. It kind of works. And so it doesn't. So let's clear this off. So... Let's look at the data file. Well, I don't want to dwell on the data file. The data file, of course, would be the nodal data, nodes 1 and the x and the y coordinates of them. You can see that there are eight nodes, four stacks of four, so it's a column that's on the side. Um, the appropriate element addresses for it. Um, the degrees of freedom are for displacements in x, displacements in y, and pore pressures as fixed boundary conditions. And so this is saying that the displacements at node 1 and x and y are fixed. Pressure is not. The displacements in the bottom node, I guess I, I should show you what this mesh looks like. It very simply looks like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's on rollers on this side. Rollers on this side, cut at the bottom, has a force of 1, I think, put here, force of 1 put here. It's 1 by 1. These are triangular elements of some kind. And so I don't want to really go through that, but you can guess that from this. So at the bottom left-hand node, the displacements are fixed. Bottom right-hand node, displacements are fixed. And all the other nodes, displacements are fixed in X. So it's constrained on rollers. Pressures aren't set. The magnitudes of those constrained displacements are zero at the bottom two nodes and then the forces which are applied in the y direction at the top two nodes are in the minus one direction. Um, and so physically what that means is that if this is a column that you draw out which has a force of one here and a force of one here, then together, obviously, it's a force of two. It's applied over a width of one and one into the page. So the stress that's applied on that boundary condition is a stress of two pascals, or whatever. And so based on uh, the fact of what we understood last time, is if it allows this to develop, then the magnitude of the pore fluid pressures if they're all carried by the fluid, those magnitudes of the pore fluid pressures should also be 2 as well. And so if you run this, and I'm just going to run it quickly and then stop talking about this, um, hopefully it will run, I guess, in this. Uh, let's see what the results are. Oh, did I clean it out? It gets to be a long file, obviously, because it gets lots of terms. Let's go up to the top and just look very quickly. Blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about that. But the initial magnitudes of the stiffness matrix, remember it's this one with the, the permeability in it in the bottom three locations in the bottom right corner with the other nine things unpopulated. So these are the terms that exist in that format. Um, the conductance matrix is the opposite for that. It has these three positions in the bottom right empty or zero. And then once we reorder them, then they look something different. So anyway, the, the matrices look rather large. Um, how big is the global matrix going to be? 
eight elements, eight nodes rather. Yeah, yeah turn four. So, so three nodes, three three degrees of freedom per node, right? Times eight nodes. So that's in its other form. So let's have a look at the results. And so the results are that I haven't turned on the flow part. It still keeps it um, from not allowing that. But the initial pressures that you get, uh, it's perhaps easy to see it in this. So this is the this is the load vector. So this is displacement x, displacement y, pressure. Displacement x, displacement y, pressure at node 2. Displacement x, displacement y, pressure at node 3. X, Y, pressure node 4, etc. So the magnitudes are 2. It's undrained. It hasn't deformed yet because it can't squeeze the fluid out of it. And so it gives exactly the right magnitude of the pressure. Uh, that so it works for that. What it doesn't work for yet, and so some of you might be interested in playing around with it, is how it steps in time. It falls apart when it does that. So it might be worthwhile uh, if you're interested in, in playing around with something, um, looking to see if you can figure that out. It would be an interesting uh, activity. So that's it. So that's how things get put uh, put together to be able to explore um, those behaviors. So relatively straightforward. And of course, that's really how ComSol is doing it as well, although you can't see it because it's all uh, source code that you, you can't access. So, so hydromechanical behaviors, we know how to look at the verification. If you're developing your own codes or even running existing codes, you need to know something about what you expect to get out. And not just it should probably go down, or it starts at that level, right? You should know, should it go in this direction or that direction if the force is being applied. And those are very simple observations you can make. But doing something a bit more quantitative um, in terms of that understanding would also, also be useful. Okay, so I skipped this. So I added a couple of things in here. So this is this that we've taken care of. In terms of this hydromechanical coupling, uh, explicit, implicit coupling between things, let's talk just briefly uh, to give a flavor, because I think this is a bit exotic, um, something that I mess around with, but it's not necessarily something that you would necessarily need to play with, but just make the case. It really falls um, directly from the couple of things we talked about. We talked about dual porosity, dual permeability models, which are ways of having these dual overlapping continua that allow us to look at the fast flow that occurs in fractures and the much slower drainage that occurs from the matrix into the fractures and then out of the reservoir. Um, and we talked about it in terms of understanding it just from the assumptions of the flow problem. No mechanics attached. So the assumptions of the flow problem implicitly is that total stresses change, don't change in the system, um, and they stay the same, and that the constitutive laws that tell you how much fluid is released aren't affected by those changes in total stresses as well. So that's an implicit assumption. It's possible to not necessarily have it conform to that. And so this is a big important thing if you're looking at fractured rocks. It's an important thing if you're looking at shales, for instance, where you have uh, fractures which tap the, the very low permeability matrix and allow you to get fluid into the fractures and then out of the fractures uh, as gas, compressible fluid. Um, but if you want to look at the role of changes in mechanical behavior, changes in total stress, then you can do it in kind of a, a logical extension of what we did for the derivation for uh, bio pore elasticity. It's exactly the same. And so I'll say maybe a few minutes worth of uh, how we might do that. Because the derivation is identical to the one that we went through for the finite element equations for single phase, single porosity, pore elasticity. And so the essence of pore elasticity is that we have the concept of effective stresses. And you remember that effective stresses control compression, displacements, and strains, uh, and also failure. But our, cons our governing equations are written in terms of total stresses, which are equilibrium equations. So the effective stress law is that total stresses are related to effective stresses and fluid pressures. And we define fluid pressures in the porous medium, I guess, by um, medium 1 and fluid pressures in the uh, fractures as medium 2. But we also define stresses in those as well. And so we can define an effective stress law for each of these materials. Um, <coughs> I guess we don't need to make that assumption yet. So for equilibrium, we know that if you look at the stresses that are acting 
in I guess in the y direction here they have to be the same within the fracture as they would be within the matrix and so this from equilibrium has to be the case that they have to be equal to each other um, if we define our constitutive behavior in terms of mechanical behavior in exactly the same way as we did for uh, permeability behavior and so that is that if we apply a stress, an effective stress, to the porous medium uh, and measure the strains over the whole system, including fractures and porous medium, then that'll be controlled by some effective constitutive matrix. And that effective constitutive matrix would kind of think the analog would be that the fractures, in this case, would be rigid and not deforming, but the matrix would be deforming. In the same way as when we talked about the equivalent permeabilities were that if it was for the porous medium, the fractures were filled with lead and were impermeable, and the porous medium was then the kind of equivalent permeability of this big porous medium that includes the structure. This is the equivalent mechanics of the porous medium that includes these fractures as being rigid. Likewise, the behavior for the compression of the fracture network would be for the fractures are now compliant and the blocks that keep them apart are absolutely rigid. And so now you're only measuring the fracture compliance. And we can calculate what these matrices are quite straightforwardly. If we write the inverse of these relationships, just write them backwards as a compliance matrix instead of a um, stiffness matrix where this compliance matrix is just the inverse of the, the stiffness matrix, then we have the inverse relationships linking uh, effective stresses to strains instead of strains to effective stresses. And the other thing that we also know is that in the same way in satisfying equilibrium, if the stresses everywhere in the, in the porous medium and the fractures are the same in both phases, then the, the sum of the displacements, the total compression of this thing is due to compression of the fractures and the, the, the compliant matrix blocks. And so if we want to get the overall strain in the system, then it's due to both the compression of the matrix and the compression of the, of the blocks. And so we can write this by substituting each one of these into here. Um, is that what we want to do? Um, what else can we do? I guess we could also substitute for the fact that these effective stresses are defined in terms of these components here. Lots of squiggly lines. And so we get total strains as a function of that. And if we write those out in longhand and, and realize that the stresses in 1 and 2 that we get are can actually be related to these compliance matrices. We have applied stresses in terms of total stresses, fluid pressures in the matrix and the fractures. These are the compliance matrices. These are the two compliance matrices added together. And since this is written in terms of total stresses, we can write this equation backwards now and write it in terms of total stresses being equal to effective stresses plus fluid pressures in the matrix and the fluid pressures effects in the fractures. So this is due to the kind of pressure gradient conditions. This is just this um, inverse of this matrix. And we have total stresses defined as strains plus fluid pressures. So this is just effective stresses looking a little differently. So once we have this, we can throw this into our equilibrium statement. This is just um, the same as our equilibrium equations. And then if we substitute for strains in terms of nodal uh, displacements, fluid pressures in terms of nodal fluid pressures, shape functions for the, the solid mechanics part, shape, no, sorry, derivatives of shape functions for the solid mechanics part. I guess we called that uppercase A before. And um, shape functions for the, uh, the mapping across the elements. And we end up with another constitutive relationship. Stiffness matrix acts on displacements. And now instead of a body force due to just one of the fluid pressures, 
we have a body force due to the fluid pressures in the matrix and a body force due to the fluid pressures in the fractures and equal to this. And so it ends up being exactly the same. And so it's exactly the same manipulations we went through before. Uh, we have one equation that represents the behavior of the one set of equations that represents the equilibrium equations in x, y, and z if we have three dimensions. And then we do continuity for flow within the matrix, I guess, in this case. Darcy's law in the matrix. Continuity written for the matrix as a function of strains and fluid squeezed out of the matrix. S uh, changes of fluid by expansion of the fluid and any applied um, flux. We, s we throw Darcy's law into this and we rearrange to get our flow equation. Um, if we mess around with the flow equation using Green's identity, uh, which we've never really returned to, conductance matrix for the matrix, um, the fluid that's squeezed out due to compression of due to strains, the fluids that's squeezed out due to changes in the fluid pressures within the matrix, and a linkage term that allows us to get fluid from the block to the fracture and vice versa, this exchange term. And so we have two, two, one equation to represent the porous medium. We do exactly the same for the fractured medium just by using a different permeability and a different pressure and switching these terms out here and we end up with the second equation, so, which will be very similar. And then finally, once you gather terms, instead of uh, having this kind of two by two system of equations, we now have one equation which represents the solid system, right? So stiffness equation, um, the body force due to fluid pressures within the matrix, and the body force due to fluid pressures within the fractures. So those all get added together to, in terms of uh, conservation of momentum. An equation which represents flow within the um, porous medium. Conductance matrix for the porous medium. Um, the amount of fluid that gets squeezed out of the porous medium by applied strains, displacements. The amount of fluid that gets squeezed out of the medium by change in fluid pressure. Remember, these are the, uh, have to be of opposite sign to each other. And displacement occurs. The medium gets smaller. It squeezes fluid out. Uh, fluid pressure changes. If it increases, the fluid volume will get smaller, and therefore you have to suck fluid in to fill up the headspace. Um, and this term, which represents exchange between the porous medium and the fracture, uh, which occurs in both, both equations. And the third equation to represent the fracture. Conductance matrix for the fracture. Um, the volume of fluid that gets squeezed out of the fracture as it displaces. The volume of fluid that comes out of the fracture as the pressure changes. Um, and I'm also pretty sure that these, uh, uh, no, not pretty sure, that these, uh, this overall matrix equation here is symmetric. Certainly the stiffness matrixes, conductance matrixes, but they're out. Uh, the storage matrix is symmetric, but these terms on the off-diagonals are also equivalent to each other as well. And you just go through it solving in exactly the same way as we did before. And so a bit more complicated, but same kind of idea. You're adding uh, extra physics to represent the behaviors where you can't physically accommodate discretizing every single fracture you have in the system, and so you accommodate the fractures in an aggregate sense that you have these effects of these spherical blocks that communicate with the fractures around them by having some interaction term here, but you also now are able to accommodate for the essential components of poro mechanics, and that is you take this sugar cube structure and now you load it. If you're doing a flow problem, there's no way that you can transform that load into the increases in fluid pressures that would occur in the system as you load, as, a, as the fluid is trying to escape. Can't escape fast enough and therefore gets caught in there as the pore volume within the system uh, shuts down. And so now, uh, using this kind of concept, uh, you can.
So I'm throwing that to you. Yeah, go ahead. It would be the same thing. I mean, this would be um, in this relationship. So this this would be this term here. And so this all this does is allow. Before uh, we didn't have this term. We did have the. We actually, we didn't have this term either. Um, yeah, we did. We have a storage term. This this is the equivalent of our storage term. Maybe we call that S one. Uh, maybe when this was all together, we called this uh, K one P one. This is S one. P1 dot, and this is plus or minus Q. And so this term for us would be something like um, the difference between the pressures in the two systems multiplied by pi e squared. Yeah, that, that's what it would be. Yeah. And pi is some scaling term which depends on the shapes of the um, whether they're spheres or whether they're plates or whatever. So that's it. Yeah. All right. So how are we doing for time? Ah, oh, we're doing great for time. So, so these are the things that we wanted to do. So we talked a little bit about um, implementing this in EGFM. We talked about dual permeability porosity models and implicit coupling. Right. So this is implicit because we solve these system equations, and we solve uh, for displacements and the generated fluid pressures at the same time as each other. And so that's what we mean by implicit coupling. If we want to be able to take that um, the next step, then we could, you know, you can start adding as much physics into this as, as you want that you think you can get away with. Um, I'll reiterate uh, my comments before that when you make models, it's best if you make the simplest model and make sure the simplest model is working before you add new physics to it, uh, rather than just say, we'll add all these components and, and hope for the best. Um, but if, for instance, you wanted to use ComSol to be able to solve problems where you start uh, not just solving for this uh, HM system that we've been doing so far, right? or MH, I guess, in this case, then we can add something else to it. And so um, what we could do is we could look at how we would do that. How do the... So the first question is, if you want to solve... Uh, thermomechanical problems. Thermomechanical problems are important for lots of things. Uh, pushing water into geothermal reservoirs, which shrink. Uh, making uh, concrete dams, which are exothermic as concrete cures, and they develop large thermal stresses. Um, from putting nuclear waste underground, uh, you name it, you can imagine what the, the applications would be. If you wanted to solve a thermomechanical problem, and this would be the way that um, ComSol would do it, it would take the solid mechanics module, uh, so this would be plane stress or plane strain. This is just, remember, this is just the uh, equilibrium equation written in the x direction. And so if we look at, there are three of these equations, one written for each of the, the three directions. When we did it online uh, for x and y, we had two of them. fx and fy were the body forces that we added. And if you remember, the body force we added uh, was something like this force in the x direction was equal to now the syntax was this uh, what was it it was um, p cx right but it would be px right the derivative so this is dp dx and so if you'd used a pressure-based uh, equation for the fluid flow part uh, in terms of fluid pressures, then P would be pressure and dpdx in ComSol parlance would be just Px. And you, can, you know where to look for that in the equation system. And so it's really very straightforward. Um, if you're looking at these in two dimensions, uh, which we didn't correct for, the fact that this alpha coefficient uh, might no longer, if you're looking at plane strain, may no longer just be alpha, but it might also have uh, Poisson ratio and Young's modulus involved in it because we've manipulated it in some way. And so that's the way that we would take care of it. Uh, we did kind of take care of it when we were dealing with the problem uh, for poor mechanics. 
if you want to look at thermomechanics, then uh, you can do things relative to some temperature, uh, which is a, a prescribed uh, reference temperature, maybe the initial temperature. So these are always relative to the initial temperatures. But if you're doing it for temperature gradients, where you start running a simulation that has temperatures in it, then I think this term would be rather similar, right? This would be what? It would be, um, you'd make a term called therm expansion. Uh, thermal expansion coefficient for rocks is typically 10 to the minus 5 um, per degree centigrade, something of that order. So anyways, but it also includes components, if you're working in plane strain or plane stress, importantly, that would be functions of the uh, elastic moduli that are included in there. And so uh, if you're coupling it with a flow, uh, a heat flow problem, then I suppose the term would be something like you'd add to this term some magnitude which would be uh, therm x therm expansion uh, times Tx. And you'd hope that um, Comsol would do that calculation for you. If, uh, if you didn't, have that, then the other way to do it would just be to use the function, which is for d derivatives, and it would be a function temperature as a function of, of x. And that would be the other way to accommodate this term here. And so the, the coupling becomes relatively straightforward. You just have to, to know how you might want to do it. So the, the, the thermal stresses are really a body force, just like the fluid pressures and they can be accommodated in exactly the same way. And so, so long as you know how both fluid pressures and temperatures are going to in evolve in your system, presumably by solving the other relevant um, field equations for fluid flow and um, heat flow, then you just use it to directly go through it. And so uh, we used a, uh, a diffusion equation instead of the, the fluid flow equation but it would be in terms of concentration, rates of changes of concentration with time. This is a new term that we had to add, and this would be a new term. But if you use the flow equation, then what would these terms be? Um, this would just be, uh, well, this is taken care of because this is a storage term where this is accommodated. This term, I suppose, would be equal to alpha b times, uh, if we split this up, um, this would be uh, change in volume strain would be change with time of change in strain in the x direction with, sorry, change in displacement in the x direction uh, plus change in displacement in the y direction uh, like this and I suppose that would be something like um, I can't remember what the terms were was there something was it u x x can you remember I can't uh, so the derivative of displacement with x could conceivably be u x time x or you could write it out, I suppose, um, without getting too convoluted, as something like um, the derivative of something as a function of time. And this would be alpha times this value. And then the something as a function of time would be the derivative of u x with x plus the derivative of vy, I think, multiply with y. And that would go in here. And so this is the derivative of both of those together. Don't know if that would work or not, but you, you get the idea. So you just have to think in terms of what the components would be. And so this is in terms of um, vectoral quantities, obviously. These are, are have uh, magnitude and also direction. 
and the magnitude of this would be uh, some term that would look like what? It would be alpha times just the derivative of t as a function of time. And so you could imagine being able to throw those individual components in, where you know, if you think about what you're doing, is you're adding a term, two terms in here that are body forces, which uh, are required for the system of equations to keep themselves in equilibrium. If you have a three-dimensional system, you have three body forces. If you have two, you just have uh, two magnitudes. It's much easier if you have three because this really is the BO coefficient. This really is the coefficient of thermal expansion only. and You don't have to worry about the other uh, uh, complicating terms for dealing with plane strain or plane stress. Uh, if you're dealing with pl uh, fluid flow, then you can look at the, um, the units of each of these terms. I think we decided before that these terms are written in terms of a volume per volume per unit time. So it's a volume of fluid put into a differential volume per unit time. And so the units of this should just be 1 over time, I think. Um, and the easiest way to show that is that the BO coefficient is uh, non-dimensional. Uh, strains are non-dimensional. And this is just 1 over time. So this term clearly here is in units of 1 over time, just from dimensional homogeneity. And so the other ones have to be exactly the same as well. This is in uh, strains per degree centigrade. So degree centigrade times strains per degree centigrade over time is just also uh, 1 over time. So always make sure your units make sense when you do this. And likewise, what's uh, the anal analogous quantity in terms of uh, thermal flow? Um, well, I guess you notice that there really is no, I haven't added a term in to represent the, um, uh, the expulsion of fluid. Presumably you could add a term which would be equal to the change in strain as a function of time multiplied by the density of fluid, its specific heat capacity, and maybe its temperature, right? Can't think what the units would be, but the idea is, if you, um, yeah. So you could imagine that. What, what are the units of this? They're going to be. Um, so uh, units of thermal conductivity are. Is it watts per meter per degree centigrade? I think um, for thermal conductivity. Temperature is in terms of centigrade. And second derivative is 1 over meter squared. So these cross out. So I guess it's in watts per cubic meter. And so any term here should be in watts per cubic meter of reference volume. And so... Um, uh, Rho C T yes well this this unit here has exactly the same dimensions as this so I think it should be okay right strain rho density specific heat capacity and temperature density specific heat capacity temperature and so all this is saying is that there's a certain amount of strain that forces a certain amount of fluid out of that volume because that fluid has been removed from that volume that amount of heat energy has been taken out of that volume as well. So you can rationalize this in terms of the, the heuristics of, of putting this thing together. So, so anyway. And so, well, a bit of a messy figure, but you get the idea. So you just need to think about uh, how you'd put these together. These are um, vectoral quantities, obviously, three equations, vectoral magnitudes of displacements and strains. These are uh, scalar relationships uh, with scalar variables included. Um, and of course, COMSOL, when it does it, does it seamlessly. So apparently that's great. Why would you ever use EGEFEM? It turns out that some, sometimes these connections and getting a stable solution in COMSOL is actually more of a, a challenge than writing the equations um, in the first place or, or rationalizing exactly how you do it. So sometimes it, it's a very powerful piece of software, but sometimes uh, uh, it can be, a, can be a challenge to actually implement these things. So in which case, you know, this, this um, former adage of 
making sure that you take the simplest component, make sure that's working before you add something to it. And when it stops working, then at least you have some way of, of being figuring out uh, exactly what's, what's going on with your system. All right. So we've talked about uh, thermohydromechanical. You can add as many onto these as you like. You could look at solute transport in the same things. You could make this uh, dual porosity. So the only limits, or dual permeability, the only limits are your own imagination and what you need to do. Uh, tempered, of course, by uh, figuring out that it's very easy to make things complicated and not have them work. It's more skillful, I'd say, to make things the minimum amount of complication you need, you know, the simplest physically possible, but includes the important physics that you need to be able to get the job done that shows the properties or the processes that you're really interested in. Uh, and it might not be sensitive to any of the other things that you're putting in. So that's the other skill that, I guess, comes from uh, playing around with these kinds of things for a little while, is figuring out what, the, what is a simple model, but are not a simplistic model. Right? Very subtle difference. But simple means that it has the essential physics and the processes that you want to understand, but not being so simplistic that it doesn't have this one important piece of uh, physics in it that's really the essence of the problem that you're completely missing in your solutions and therefore your solutions are not worth much. Okay. All right, so all of these things so far uh, have been implicitly coupled. So both EGE, FEM and um, the, the suggestions that we had for doing these computations in COMSOL are implicitly coupled because we solve all the systems at the same time. Sometimes that's not so easy, and sometimes it's not the fastest way to get to the solution that you want. And in the same way that we talked about implicit methods and explicit methods for fluid flow, we made the point that implicit methods are great because they should actually be, we didn't really say it, I don't think, but they should actually be um, the most accurate because you're solving things at one time for all of the variables at the same time. They're implicitly stable. Uh, unconditionally, uh, con yeah, unconditionally stable, so you can use big time steps and they should be relatively stable. But they're typically not the best way to solve things if you have really nonlinear problems because in nonlinear problems you have to go back and you have to recreate your stiffness matrices, and conductance matrices, and then resolve the system of equations with those new matrices that you have, may have to do again the next step. And so in those cases you might want to solve in explicit methods for two reasons. One is it's much easier to put together the conductance matrices and solve them. And the second D is that the nonlinearity of your problem might be such that you might anyway have to take very small time steps anyway to get the right solution to be able to march, discretize in time well enough to get the right solution. And so in that case you might choose to use explicit coupling um, in time. Um, but the other um, component of that is that sometimes it's a, an easy way to be able to link existing codes that do a really good job uh, and are well validated that if you're smart you could figure out how to link them together. And so that's what we'll talk about now is how you take a code that does something very well. It could be something like Fluent uh, that solves for chemical engineering uh, problems well. Um, and you might want to couple that with some structural mechanics program like NASTRAN or ADINA to be able to solve a fluid structure interaction problem, for example. And so um, I won't talk uh, in great detail about it, uh, but um, I will uh, refer you to this paper by Josh Tarrin to make uh, the case of what I, I really want to say. And so this was, is trying to solve some problems in reservoir geomechanics for geothermal reservoirs. And the, the situation is this. Um, if you flow water through fractured media, which are relatively low permeability, um, the fractures in those media tend to be soft compared to the parent material that they're made from. And uh, relatively small changes in the compression or the dilation of those fractures can give you big changes in permeability that then feed back into controlling the rates at which fluids, cold fluids would permeate through this and quench the, the network and therefore uh, the rates at which permeability enhancement would, 
would travel through the network. And so one way to solve this problem where there's this really very sensitive uh, medium, pressure sensitive medium, uh, through effective stresses. So if you change the fluid pressures, you change effective stresses and dilate or compact fractures. If you change the temperatures, um, you cause thermal stresses and thermal strains, which are also effective stresses, and you change the uh, dilation or compaction of fractures, and therefore the permeability characteristics of them. Or if you uh, deposit or remove uh, minerals by dissolution or precipitation, you also have the same effects as well. And so you could start with COMSOL, and you could go back to this idea that, uh, for instance, if you wanted to take these equations we talked about here, well, what, what we've got? We've got most of them. We've got a solid mechanics matrix. We've got a flow matrix. We've got a heat flow matrix. And then I suppose we'd add something like um, uh, a diffusion equation with a reaction term for each one of the, the components that we had in the system as well. And so we could do it using COMSOL. Um, if we're solving a three-dimensional problem, we would have um, three degrees of freedom for displacements, one degree of freedom for pressures, one degree of freedom for temperatures, and as many degrees of freedom for concentrations for the species that we had. Right. So we'd have um, three, four, five, five plus three components for, um, we, we did a problem with two, I guess. So three, four, five, six, seven equations that we'd solve. Six variables, six nodal variables that we'd solve. And so we certainly could do that with COMSOL. Um, whether you get a stable solution or not might be a challenge, would be my guess. Uh, we've certainly had people work on that, um, uh, so it's a challenge. So the other approach is to take two codes that are originally, originally doing this. And so this was an application for taking two codes. One, in this case, uh, FLAC3D, uh, which is a, a solid mechanics code that solves the equilibrium equation with very complicated, uh, complex constitutive equations. Bohr Coulomb, Drucker Prager, um, Hook Brown, a variety of different uh, failure criteria and plasticity models, and does a very good job of doing that but doesn't do anything in terms of multi-phase flow. And take another model, which does no mechanics whatsoever, but solves um, the conservation equations. It solves conservation equations for fluid flow, for variably saturated flow, with different saturations of fluid 1 and fluid 2. Fluid 1 could be uh, water. Fluid 2 could be steam or air. Uh, it solves heat transport for dual porosity porous media as well. So for uh, temperatures in the uh, fluid within the fractures and temperatures within the porous matrix. Uh, and it serves, solves for multi-component uh, transport and reaction in both of those systems, which is tough. Uh, I'm trying to remember what tough react. Tough is a kind of a, a geothermal simulator. And I'm trying to remember what the acronym is. It is, it is an acronym for something, but I can't remember what it is. And so you can use those in isolation. You solve the mechanics problem. It speaks to itself. It's on its own. You solve the transport, flow, tra flow and transport and reaction problem. They don't talk to each other at all. So you have to find some way of being able to, to link them. And so then the question is how to, to link them. Before we talk about that, the other question is, are they solving the same physical space? And it turns out that FLAC is actually a finite difference model for solid mechanics. But it works almost like a finite element model, where it has um, the nodes are actually at the corners of these elements. So it's a corner cent corner centric uh, node on elements. Tough, on the other hand, solves is a block finite difference model, which looks at fluid flow and transport between blocks, where it just looks at the variables at the centers of those blocks. So initially, they're on two different grids, which they need to, to understand. And so the way to do that, of course, are to take the variables that you prescribe at these nodes and to be able to map them 
map the displacements onto the places where you have pressures and temperatures at the middle nodes. And so you can co-locate values at those locations. And likewise, take the values for the fluid pressures that you might have at these central block-centered nodes and be able to apply those at the locations where you'd have displacements for the solid mechanics part. So that, that's one challenge, but not insurmountable. You just have you just map things. You use the same kind of mapping functions and techniques that we've talked about in using shape functions. So that's the, the first part. The second part is how you uh, rationalize solving it. And so the rationalization here is that um, you take a grid and you apply some loads to it and you use the solid mechanics pro program to solve for the fluid pressures, the undrained fluid pressures that you, you get from that. Just as in the same way when we talked about EGE, FEM today, we apply these loads at the top. The initial time step gives us the fluid pressures at the nodes or in, within the elements. And so you can do that with FLAC 3D to solve for the fluid pressures. You take those fluid pressures, you apply it within um, this system here. Uh, the fluid pressures may be out of balance because you're applying different loads at different places because of the different compliances within your model. And you apply those fluid pressures. You allow the fluid solver to take the fluid pressures and to redistribute them. So pressure 1 goes to pressure T plus delta T which then goes back into the solid mechanics part. You reapply to calculate the new undrained uh, fluid pressures that are developed, and then you use the flow code to be able to redistribute them. So it's, it's just that. And so it's merely using this kind of leapfrog approach. You calculate one thing, apply loads, get mechanical deformations, get fluid pressures. You apply it kind of in the next step or in the same step uh, to the, the fluid simulator to be able to figure out how the fluid pressures drive flow. Those flows drive transport of heat and mass. Reactions occur. And then you go to the mechanical part again and you just uh, repeat. And so you can get relatively uh, sophisticated at this and, and use a whole bunch of different codes. You just have to realize exactly what you are trying to solve. And so I won't go through the, um, the intricacies of it. You can read that in this if you so wish. But really, it's embodied, I think, in this, uh, this figure here, kind of describes the, the main logic to it. And that's probably all you need to know in this class. I, I will, and there's, there are details of how to do it. Basically, this is the idea here, is that if you apply undrained uh, stresses to a system uh, and you prescribe the zero strains and fluid strains, how do you use the compliance matrix information to be able to figure out exactly what the fluid pressures are that you develop in the system. It's nothing more than that. So I, I won't talk any more than that. But um, the results of this actually allow you to be able to do exactly the kinds of things that we've been talking about. And that is here you take a column, you load this column vertically with some applied load, and we know that if it's an undrained system on rollers, that initially if the fluid can't get out, then it generates some fluid pressures, and then slowly over time, as those fluid pressures are able to dissipate as it flows out of the top, then you'd expect the fluid pressures to, um, to disappear. And so this is just a, a verification model of doing exactly that. The dots here are the calculated magnitudes, the theoretical magnitudes of the solid lines, and these are for the dissipation of fluid pressures uh, relative to the induced fluid pressure as a function of time. Um, the ones that is uh, deepest must be, um, the ones that will take longest, I think, are going to be the ones that are deepest. So this must be um, close to the top. This is the bottom one. Yeah, this is down here. And just looking at the, the rates of change. And uh, so you could use that to, well, verifying that it actually, one, calculates the right magnitudes of the fluids. It doesn't do a very good job here, as you see, but also that it dissipates as a function of time exactly spot on the uh, expected curves. And the other, the lower solution, is looking at the magnitudes of the displacement that occurs as a function of time. 
So the displacement relative to the top displacement at infinity. So if you add this load, initially there's no displacement, but ultimately after all the pressures have dissipated after this point, then all the deformation should have occurred on this, and that magnitude will be u infinity. And so the uppermost node should have uh, dissipated and give a full displacement. The lowermost node should give the opposite. Well, there isn't a, z a zero node, but the, the lowermost node would be here. So these are the undrained magnitudes of the displacement that it asymptotes to, and whatever those the the magnitudes and the evolution of those should be, again compared with the analytical solutions. So that's the other way to be able to to solve these problems. And so. The essence of this class, I think, is dealing with this coupling and this idea of rationalizing in your own mind exactly how you implement these couplings in a rational way. And it really, I suppose, the essence of it is it comes back to the uh, understanding what conservation equations are. So the conservation equations for solid mechanics are uh, conservation momentum or force equilibrium. And so body forces are the terms that we can use to make them talk to each other. Um, for all of the... Um, Transport problems, fluid flow, uh, mass transport by diffusion and direction, and also heat transfer, it's conservation of fluid mass, dissolved mass, and thermal energy per unit volume per unit time. And so, so long as the components that you're uh, talking to those codes with for the solid mechanics ones are in those right units, then you could probably imagine with some feel for what's going on. Uh, exactly what those magnitudes should be. Um, so that's all I wanted to say on that.